This lecture has been made available to you courtesy of the American Numismatic Society. Right. Well, I would like to welcome everybody to today's long table. This is long table 196, I believe. So we're inching up to long table 200, which is going to be quite the milestone. Um, I am more than happy to introduce our speaker today, who is a recent uh, summer seminar or summer seminar student. Um, the students don't actually officially graduate from the seminar until they turn in their final papers, which are due on the 31st of December. So still a little bit of time before um, that date comes up. Uh, our speaker today is um, Kari Fosum. She is a PhD candidate at Bryn Mawr in the uh, uh, Classics and Archaeology, Near Eastern Archaeology Department. Uh, she has been working for a while on various Achaemenid um, uh, projects and um, her interest recently, uh, or actually for a while now, has been on the Black Sea. And so she, uh, this last summer while she was here, was looking at some of the problems of um, coinages produced by some Black Sea cities that all were founded um, by the city of Miletus. So these were essentially colonies. And the question that has been lingering for a very long time is whether or not there was some sort of cooperative effort between these three mints of Olbia um, Sinopian history, in part because they share similar obverses with this dolphin and eagle. And so she um, worked on this this summer as her uh, summer seminar project, and she will be presenting this today as uncooperative coinages, reconsidering the eagle and dolphin issues of Sinope, Histria, and Olbia. So Kari, all yours. Thank you so much for the introduction, Peter, and thank you to everyone for taking this hour out of your day to hear about the coins of these three cities. Oh no. Sorry, continuing to encounter Zoom issues. All right, there we go. So before getting to the coins themselves, I just want to take a moment to situate them and all of us um, geographically. Sinope, Histria, and Olbia were during the period that I'll be looking at today, so the fifth and fourth centuries, um, culturally Greek settlements located on the shores of the Black Sea. According to the literary tradition, each had been established by Miletus, another culturally Greek settlement located in southwestern Turkey during the Archaic period, although these traditions are generally quite late, and there is reason to doubt the notion that any of these cities were connected by any common Milesian cultural heritage, um, or what might be called in Greek nomima. Now onto the coins. Despite these source difficulties that I've mentioned, um, that identify my lease, my lease as, as the mother city of Sinope, Histria, and Olbia, an uncritical acceptance of this as a fact underpins the body of scholarship that is built up around the silver coins, sharing this eagle and dolphin reverse type issued by each city during the fifth and fourth centuries. This tendency is quite clear to see in the two most recent synoptic treatments of these coins, where um, they have been described as possible evidence for a sort of Milesian trading alliance um, or connected to a myth about the Milesian, Milesian colonization of the Black Sea, something for which I should mention we have no evidence. The main issue with these conclusions and what I focus on in this project is that they are, as a rule, based on iconography alone, neglecting what I will call the economic aspects of these coins. This neglect raises the first question that I address today, namely how the eagle and dolphin coins issued by Sinope, Histria, and Olbia interacted, to which a consideration of the circulation patterns of the coins and their weights suggests the answer is virtually not at all. This negative answer, which caused me to restructure my original plan, which had been to bring these coins into ongoing conversations about cooperative and coordinated coinages, um, in which conversations, I should say, Peter has been an, an important voice, prompts a concatenation of other questions, some of them about the coins themselves, and others about the broader context of the classical and early Hellenistic Black Sea and its economies. The structure of this presentation will follow my development of these questions from the specific to the general. 
Starting with the coins, I'll present my preliminary conclusions drawn from their circulation patterns, weight standards, and the functions that we can extrapolate from these. Then proceeding from the reality that these coins did not circulate together, perhaps because their disparate weights would have made them inconvenient to exchange, I'll discuss the other archeological evidence for interaction and exchange between these three cities during our period. This opens the door to the question of monetization or more precisely how coin monetized the economy was in this geographical and chronological context. And on to my broader argument that this economy comprised to borrow a few words from Michael Loy, overlapping but separate networks, few of which may even by the classical and early Hellenistic period have required coins to operate. So with that exposition out of the way, I'll move on to the numismatic evidence, looking first at the circulation patterns of these coins insofar as they can be identified through the hoard evidence before moving on to the weight standards that each city chose to strike their coins on. Hoards containing Sinopean eagle and dolphin coins have without exception been found in what would have been at the time of their deposition, the territory of the Achaemenid Empire. This is unsurprising given that two of the five identifiable groups of these coins were issued by or in the names of Achaemenid officials but it's nevertheless significant for two main reasons. First, what it suggests about the intended function of these coins. So more likely as military pay or tribute than as media of market exchange. And second, what it suggests about how these coins may have been used. So perhaps as bullion rather than as coins in the way that we think of them. Boards containing the history and eagle and dolphin coins have likewise been found in a relatively circumscribed but very different area generally between history itself and the Dniester River, so the western boundary of modern Ukraine, um, but with some exceptions across the Carpathians and in the vicinity of Olbia. This suggests use not only by the Greek populations who moved into the area in the 7th and 6th centuries, but also by the pre-existing populations um, who we might think of as Thracians. Our awareness of the political situation in classical and early Hellenistic history is much poorer than our awareness of what was happening at this time in Sinope and Olbia, but it's not outside the realm of possibility that here too, these silver coins may have been used for military or tribute payments, perhaps to Thracian elites. It should also be mentioned that the history and silver coins were produced in a wider range of denominations than their counterparts in Sinope and Olbia, suggesting that they may also have had a wider range of uses or utility and transactions of different scales. Finally, the Olbian coins, as you can see quite clearly, had the most restricted circulation with few exceptions within Olbia and its Cora, so between the Dniester and the Bug rivers. It is plausible that we are seeing here the so-called Kenobos decree, which effectively um, limited the circulation of Olbian coins to Olbia itself in action. I'll now move on to the weight standards, starting with Sinope. Changes in weight and iconography make it possible to differentiate five groups of Sinopean coins, which map more directly onto what we know of the city's history, history than is true for Histria or for Olbia. This is in large part because we have more textual evidence to work from, although it should be noted that from the archeological perspective, we know much less about Sinope than we know about the other two cities. During the 5th and 4th centuries, control of Sinope seems to have passed back and forth between Athens, the Achaemenid Empire, and at least one rogue Achaemenid satrap, and the Sinopeans themselves. The first group of eagle and dolphin coins from this city has been associated with one of these periods of Sinopean self-rule towards the end of the 5th century, um, perhaps from about 413 to the end of the first third of the 4th century, Although it's not quite clear in the case of Sinope, nor Histria or Olbia, exactly when the first groups of their eagle and dolphin coins were produced. The second group of Sinopean coins can be dated with more competence because on these coins, the inscription Sino in Greek was replaced with Data, an abbreviation of the name Tatames, to that point a satrap in Kylikia, um, who was by then in full revolt and marching his troops through Anatolia um, around 370 BCE. We might, as several scholars have pointed out, be able to see a reference to Datames's Sinopean coinage in this passage of Pseudo-Aristotle. While this does require reading Sinope for Amisos, 
um, if this reading is permissible, we may learn from this passage the source of silver that was used for this coinage is minting. At any rate, Tatamius's revolt was only partially successful and he was eventually assassinated. After his assassination, it seems that control of Sinope was passed into the hands of more um, loyal Achaemenid allies. And at this time, we see a third group with Aramaic inscriptions and struck, I'm willing to accept as Sigloi on the Persian standard. Um, one of these Achaemenid officials, Ariarathes, can be securely identified in the literary record, which provides us with another chronological fixed point for the coins that bear his name, so um, towards the end of the fourth century. The fourth and fifth groups then, with their return to a Greek inscription and the city ethnic, Sino again, can plausibly be associated with the collapse of the Achaemenid Empire and a return to relative Sinopean autonomy. Sorry. Sorry again. Had some PowerPoint issues, again, my apologies. Um, at any rate, the first, second, and fourth groups of these coins have been described as having been struck on a light egg and eaten standard. And as you can see, the 80th percentile weights that can be calculated for these groups are several tenths of a gram off the ideal egg and eaten dram weight of 6.2 um, grams. This seems a marginal difference and can hardly have been tangible to someone actually using the coins, but they wouldn't have been negligible as they would have been experienced by the producers of these coins and whoever had to source the metal necessary to mint them. The issue of coins being minted at a discount from a parent standard has been raised, if not in the specific case of Sinope. But what, is it, what has attracted less attention is the question of at what threshold, if any, a margin of metrological error should be understood as an indication that a different, perhaps local weight standard was in use. To answer this question, it's necessary to consider why an issuing authority chose or chose to change to a weight standard in the first place. Factors that might influence this type of choice could be a desire to facilitate trade or expand markets, military involvement, recourse to a city's nomima, so their sort of traditional connections to other cities, political control, and financial crisis. A question that the nature of the sources makes more approachable from Sinope than from the other two cities um, is whether the choice in Sinope of what is supposed to be a variant of the Egonetan standard and the subsequent movement from this to the Persian standard and back again, followed by a drop off at the end of the fourth century to a five gram or so dram, which can't be associated with any weight standard that I've been able to identify, um, can be explained by one or more of the factors that I've just listed. It's clear from the weights of these coins themselves, where and how they circulated, um, and their historical context that the choice of weight standards on which they were to be struck was not conditioned by a desire to facilitate trade or by any nomima. Setting aside some ambivalent textual evidence for Egonetan activity in Sinope during the fifth and fourth centuries, I want to highlight in relation to the first point that it was Athens and not Egina that had interests in Sinope during the classical period. And more importantly, that only a single published hoard contains both Sinopean eagle and dolphin coins and Egonetan staters of the tortoise variety. This hoard was recovered in Malier near Hamadan or ancient Ekbatana in Iran and contained around 400 coins in total from elsewhere in Anatolia, Thrace and Macedonia, mainland Greece and the Aegean, the West, including Corsaira and Sicily, Northern Africa, two Phoenician cities and Persia, all struck on a wide variety of weight standards. This variety is perhaps unsurprising given the hoard's fine spot and the consensus that while Greek silver coins were in demand in the territory of the Achaemenid Empire, their value would likely have been as bullion rather than at face. That some of the Sinopean eagle and dolphin coins may have been treated as bullion may be further substantiated by the realities that hoards containing them have without exception, as I've already mentioned, been found in territories that would have been under Achaemenid control. And moreover, that the examples of these coins included in hoards have often been test cut as the example pictured here has been. In summary, there is little evidence of any kind to support the identification of the weights of the first, second, and fourth group of Sinopean coins as necessarily being Egonetan in weight, and while acknowledging the deficiencies, especially a lack of published excavation finds of the available data, 
there's reason to suggest that the weights of individual coins did not hinder their possible bullion usage. The possible treatment of the Sinopean eagle and dolphin coins as bullion, at least in territories controlled by the Achaemenid Empire, does little to explain why there was a change in weight standard between the second group, issued by or in the name of Datames, and the third group, whose defining characteristic is the substitution of Aramaic for Greek. It would have made sense for the introduction of the Persian weight standard to coincide with the imposition of Achaemenid, Achaemenid authority in or over Sinope, yet Datames made the decision to keep the weight standard already in use or something approximating it. This is especially interesting in view of the three groups issued by or in the name of Datames at Tarsus in Kylikia as a double sigloi on the Persian standard. So why should Datames issue coins on the Persian standard here, but not at Sinope? Thinking back on the passage from Pseudo-Aristotle that we've already seen, the simple explanation that what mattered to Datames was making visually clear that he was responsible for the provision of the metal used to produce the second group of Sinopean eagle and dolphin coins, and otherwise, the mint in that city could carry on operations as it had been, may be advanced. A one-time satrap in all-out revolt against the Achaemenid Empire would have no incentive to impose a new weight standard, and especially not a new weight standard associated with the authority from which he was revolting, in a region where it was unfamiliar and could potentially, although not certainly, um, given the lack of clarity about the degree to which coins produced according to different weight standards could or did interact, disrupt the local economy. It may be relevant here that many of Datames' soldiers may have been Greek mercenaries, some of them perhaps from Sinope, and familiar and comfortable with its earlier silver coins. Although different on its face, the reason for Datames' retention of, of the Persian standard at Tarsus may also be owed simply to precedent and the maintenance of normal mint operations. Coins struck on the Persian standard, and moreover, as this double siglos denomination, had been issued there by Datames' immediate predecessor, Pharnabazus. I'll note, however, that Datames' later Tarsian coins are lighter than the earliest group. Here, too, we may see an aspect of his rebellion, and also ask just how Persian a double siglos, short nearly a whole gram of silver, should be considered to be. The switch to the Persian standard for the third group may be more straightforwardly described as imposition, especially in the wake of a partially successful rebellion, a time when the reassertion of Achaemenid authority in whatever ways were possible may have been a priority. It is significant in this connection that the coins belonging to this group are more consistent with the Persian standard than the first, second, or fourth group are with the Aganetan standard. The return with the fourth group to what has been identified as a reduced Aganetan standard has been associated with the fall of the Achaemenid Empire and the resurgence of an autonomous Sinope, but the simultaneous issue of a much lighter, around five gram per dram, fifth group, distinguished from the fourth only by a small detail on the obverse, um, as well as the weight, is more difficult to explain. This weight is difficult to describe as even a reduced version of any known denomination, and its appearance cannot be tied to a specific historical circumstance that may have prompted Sinope to devalue its silver coinage. It may be possible that the five or so gram weight belongs to a still unidentified local weight standard, as could also be the case for the six gram light egg and eaten dram. Another possibility is that these fluctuations could be connected to a series of downward shifts in the silver to gold exchange rate in accumulated Anatolia during the fifth and fourth centuries, as recently discussed by Kagan and Ellis Evans, but this will require um, more research to verify. The choices and sequence of changes of the weight standards used in Histria are more difficult to understand for two main reasons. First, the historical sources are virtually non-existent, and second, the coins themselves lack any characteristics or information in the form of inscriptions that could serve as fixed chronological points. It is a significant problem that not a single example belonging to what have been identified by style and weight as the first and second groups have been found in a datable archaeological context, and it is similarly unhelpful that when coins belonging to these, these two groups have been found in hordes, they have been found on their own, so not in the company of any other coins that can be more securely dated. 
Thus, the sequence of the four groups that has been established, and even more, the absolute dates which have come to be attached to these groups, is not as secure as one would hope. It is unfortunately the case that the known quantities of coins belonging to the first two groups, again, the ones that we know the least about, have only increased by a few specimens each since um, the publication of what remains the consensus back typology in 1968, and none of these new coins have been found in conditions which would permit any revision of the already provisional chronology that you see reproduced here. Moving on from typology and sequence to weights, you'll immediately notice that the discrepancies between the average observed weights and the ideal weights of the standards with which each of the four groups of history and coins have been associated exceed the variability of the observed weights of the Sinopean coins from the standards that they have been associated with. I'll also highlight the fact that the light Egonetan Sinopean coins each weigh around six grams, whereas the same standard um, as it's been assigned to the history and coins weighs around a quarter of a gram less on average. So a question that might be asked is how light is too light to still be somehow egg and eaten? And what does applying this label to what it seems possible to me could be two entirely different standards at any rate used for coins that operated in two different areas even mean? It's interesting that the um, 6.85 gram light slidomyelesian diagram of the second and third group can be divided into drams weighing um, a little under three and a half grams each, effectively equal to the ideal weight of the Rhodian dram, which standard is itself supposed to have been reduced from the Cayenne standard. The Rhodian standard did not come into use until the turn of the third century, and so has not been seen as an option for these mid fourth century history and coins. But the point that I want to make here is that more or less precise coincidences in weight need not necessarily indicate the use of a common standard. Moreover, taking a functional approach to the idea of a weight standard, the choices of these standards, so here, Attic, Lidomyelesian, and Egonetan, in this region on this timeline, neither make a huge amount of sense in light of what little we know about history as external relationships, nor would their reduction likely have done much to streamline any economic or exchange relationships that did exist. I should reiterate that Histria, unlike Sinopure Olvia, issued silver fractions alongside the larger diagrams or staters of the second, third, and fourth groups, which may point to a more coin monetized local economy here than in Sinope. Olvia did issue small denomination coins, but these were bronze and they never issued um, silver fractions. So moving on to Olvia, this city's silver eagle and dolphin coins were likely issued from around the time that Zapirian, a general of Alexander, laid siege to Olbia in 334 or so, through the end of the 4th century. This notion is not unassailable, but there is at least some more support than is the case for the dating of the earliest eagle and dolphin coins from Sinope or Histria in the form of um, a series of lead coins that seem to actually share the dyes of this silver series. These were not Olbia's first silver coins, but over a century stood between their introduction and the only earlier Olbian silver, the so-called Eminako staters of the mid-fifth century, which you can see here at left, um, themselves struck on a rather enigmatic weight standard. The silver eagle and dolphin coins from Olbia can be divided by weight into two groups, one coming to an average of 8.37 and the other of 12 grams. The lighter weight coins have been described as attic weight and the heavier as egonetan, but once again, there is a disjunction between the observed and ideal weights, and once again, there is no clear reason why Olbia would have chosen to use either of these standards, especially not at the end of the fourth century. Scholars, especially during the Soviet period, have placed much emphasis on potential Athenian influence in Olbia, and even the city's possible, if temporary, membership in the Athenian League. Most, if not all, of the evidence for this, including what has been identified as a fragment of a copy of the Athenian Standards Decree found in Olbia, is either very dubious or possible to interpret in other ways. Even if the Olbian copy of the Standards Decree is legitimate, it's not clear that this decree had any real effect in Olbia or any other city in the Archaic. I would also emphasize that even if this decree did take effect in Olbia at the end of the fifth century, which again, I should really emphasize there's no evidence for, there would be no reason to assume that it continued um, 
to be in effect through the end of the fourth century, at which time it would still become necessary to reconcile with the simultaneous issue of possibly Egonetan weight Olbian silver coins. The argument might be made that it would make sense for Olbia, something of a trading center, to issue coins on both the Attic and Egonetan standard so as to facilitate exchange with traders coming from those two centers or places that use their customary weight standards, to which I would respond that no Attic or Egonetan or even um, Attic or Egonetan weight coins issued by other authorities have been found in or near Olbia. To this can also be added that, as the distribution of hoards suggests, Olbian coins, whether silver or bronze, did not circulate to the west of the Dniester or to the east of the Bug. Thus, even if Olbia did use modified versions of the Attic and Egonetan standards, its coins still seem to have been meant for local consumption and to meet local needs. Further study of the silver as well as the bronze coins and the additional body of evidence provided by balance weights found in Olbia and its Cora, as well as Histria and its environs, um, but not Sinope as far as we know because of the lack of excavation, may clarify this issue. I'll just say a few words about the balance weights, um, which have proven to be a bit of a vexing element in this project, but hopefully one that will um, be profitable to address. I've chosen to show these two examples of balance weights, the one at left from Terry Verde, a city near Histria, and the one at right from Olbia, primarily because it is clear to see that they bear an iconographical relationship to the eagle and dolphin coins issued by these two cities. Of the approximately 40 balance weights from Histria and 130 from Olbia that I've assembled, relatively few resemble these cities' coins in this respect, and the eagle and dolphin iconography is much more common um, on Histrian than on Olbian weights, the specimen pictured here being the only extant example of such a weight from Olbia. It's not clear whether the balance weights from these two cities bear any relationship to their coins when it comes to their weights, which is in large part a consequence of the fundamental difficulties of dealing with ancient balance weights in general. Perhaps the greatest of these when it comes to trying to identify weight standards is that it's not clear how precisely balance weights were calibrated, although it's generally assumed that this would have been less precisely than coin weights. This is compounded by the fact that it can be very difficult to determine how much weight has been lost since antiquity, and even specimens that appear to be in good condition may be rather lighter now than they were then, depending on their material, so lead is a bit more susceptible to weight loss than bronze, um, and how they were treated after coming out of the ground, which is more of a problem for older finds than for more recent finds. And unfortunately, most of the history and Olbian finds are from um, sort of the mid 20th century. Another issue is that, as is so often the case, the situation in 5th and 4th century Athens has often served as the benchmark for the study of balance weights from other places and even other periods. This is certainly true for history and Olbia, and the tendency in the scholarship has been to make the observed weights fit one of the Attic trade weight standards, no matter what mathematical contortions are required. Thus, my main aim in looking at these weights in this context is, as with the coins, to raise the question of whether there might be any better alternatives to assuming the use of the Attic standard. Although few of the weights from either Histria or Olbia were recovered from secure contexts, and this reality does present a very significant obstacle in conducting any meaningful analysis, those that are tend to be datable to the second half of the fourth century or later, so after Athens is supposed to have exerted its power on the Black Sea, and at a time when neither Histria nor, as I have argued, Olbia were minting their silver coins on the Attic standard. Now, it's not necessary that a city would use the same weight standard for its coins and its balance weights, and thinking of Athens, which is always difficult to avoid, the same denomination on the same standard, for example, the mina, could have different weights depending on its intended use, but from my perspective, there would be definite advantages to having a unified or at least related system and so this seems a possibility worth exploring. What I'll do now is briefly walk you through my process of um, doing this exploring, taking this weight from Terry Verde at left as an example. As I mentioned, it's difficult to know how the preserved weight of a balance weight, even one that appears to be in good condition, compares to its original or intended weight, for which reason my first step is to calculate an upper bound for an original weight range based on a hypothetical loss of up to 
This percentage loss is surely too high for some specimens, including this one, and maybe too low for others, but it should help to establish a reasonable, if over wide, range for the original weight of each balance weight. From there, it's really just a matter of division. This weight, which so helpfully indicates its own denomination, was found during systematic excavation, but in a context that could not be more precisely dated than the early Hellenistic period. For that reason, I took the average weights of the third and fourth groups of history and coins as my divisors, which yielded ranges of history and drams per mina that you can see here. And I've also put up the Egonetan and the relevant Attic equivalencies for comparison. Establishing these ranges is simple enough, but deciding what can actually be done with them is much more challenging. Without knowing how closely our average observed coin weights come to their intended weights on whatever standard was in use or even what the denominations of these coins were, so were they drams, were they diagrams, um, it's not entirely clear. Any attempt to identify equivalencies with balance weights, especially those that do not state their denomination, like this example, is impossible to verify. Both of these calculated ranges contain a variety of round numbers of history and drams that could represent the standard for a history and or perhaps Western Pontic Mina, but could equally be coincidental. I should also mention that considering that both history and Olvia were port cities, it's probable that more than one trade weight standard was known and used. And if there are history and Olvian standards to be identified, they may well have been devised to be compatible with the more common of these other standards. With this in mind, I'm continuing to work on my assemblages of balance weights from these cities, in each case, keeping an eye out not only for potential correspondences to coin weights, but also for patterns emerging among the weights from each city and between the weights from both cities. For the reasons that I've already given, certain conclusions will be hard to come by, but my hope is that by continuing in this direction, it will be possible to determine whether common or at least compatible trade weight standards were in use in Histria and Olbia at the same time as different coin weight standards, which could, as does some of the archaeological evidence, point to the coexistence of plural economic networks operating in parallel yet on different scales and perhaps to facilitate different types of exchange. The next step on from the coins and the balance weights is to move towards a reconciliation of the apparent lack of numismatic cooperation or coordination with the other archaeological evidence, with the hope of clarifying the nature um, of these networks. Um, so what you see here is a timeline of the different materials that I've chosen to look at in addition to the coins namely terracottas, tiles, and amphorae, organized by their earliest appearance in each city. These materials are fit for purpose because they're generally well published and their provenance can be identified with some confidence based on fabric as well as export stamps. As we've seen, the eagle and dolphin iconography appears on the coins of Sinope, Histria, and Olbia, and balance weights from the latter two cities. And here I'll add that the same iconography was used by Sinope to stamp its roof tiles and amphorae for export, while in Histria it was used as something like a signature on certain official inscriptions. There are some difficulties to overcome in dealing with this material, the first being its volume, the corresponding volume of its publication, and the characteristic inconsistencies of this publication. And it's also important to keep in mind that not all exported ceramics were stamped, um, and we also aren't exactly sure when the stamping practice started. So it's possible that some of this exchange started before we can really securely identify it. Um, at any rate, on the available evidence, we can't determine with certainty what Sinope may have been receiving in return or even in exchange, or even if exchange between Histria and Sinope or Olbia and Sinope was direct or instead involved commercial traders as middlemen. Some evidence from Olbia, namely inscriptions um, of the fifth and fourth centuries describing personal relationships, no doubt with an economic component between Olbians and Sinopeans, makes it possible to assume at least some direct interaction, but a comparable situation in Histria can only be conjecture in the absence of any similar testimony. Architectural terracottas from Sinope begin to appear in Olbia during the fifth century, at around the same time that inscriptions describing grants of proxeny, politeia, and atelea um, erected in Olbia begin to inform us of relationships between individuals from these cities. 
The import of roof tiles probably starts around the same time and increases steadily until it reaches a peak during the third quarter of the fourth century, afterwards decreasing gradually. Sinope and amphorae come onto the scene in Oldia and elsewhere after tiles and terracottas during the second quarter of the fourth century. And their import, pe import peaks from the end of the fourth through the beginning of the third century. So precisely as tile and terracotta imports seem to drop off. Sinope and roof tiles in Histria um, appear significantly later than in Olbia by the middle of the fourth century and relatively small but consistent quantities continue to be imported until the beginning of the third century. Sinope and amphorae follow roof tiles in Histria as in Olbia, but by a smaller margin and their import peak falls several decades later than the same in Olbia. The chronology is not altogether clear, but it's possible that the appearance of Sinopean architectural terracottas in Olbia, as well as the inscriptions that I mentioned, predates by a small margin the issue of the earliest bronze Olbian eagle and dolphin coins. In general, Sinopean products appear to have reached Olbia before Histria, and one possible explanation for this could be that Sinopean Olbia were in direct contact and Olbia, or rather Olbian merchants, traded some of these Sinopean products on to contacts in Histria. This is, for now, just a hypothesis, but one that would have significant implications for our understanding of the relationships between these supposed sister cities, and possibly also their affiliations with Miletus, and the transmission of the eagle and dolphin iconography. Moving forward, I also plan to look further into Sinopean and Histrian and Olbian, if possible, imports to other communities around the Black Sea, for example, on its eastern coast, where Sinopean eagle and dolphin coins, as well as ceramics, have been found together, and in fact, Sinopean potters seem to have been at work. I now turn to the final part of my project, considering the networks that connected Sinope, Histria, and Olbia, even if we must keep the possibility of middleman involvement open, and the mechanisms of exchange that facilitated communication and commerce across them. This opens the door to the topic of monetization, or more precisely, how coin monetized the economy of the classical and early Hellenistic Black Sea was. As I've tried to demonstrate, the eagle and dolphin coins issued by Sinope, Histria, and Olbia were issued to meet city-specific, local needs, and were not involved in intra- or inter-regional interactions even if these interactions may have facilitated the spread and sharing of their iconography. One consideration, however, does stand in the way of claiming that these interactions operated completely independently of coin money, that one thing being Electrum. What you see here is a distribution map of published hoards containing Electrum coins color-coded by date. Keeping in mind that I've omitted hoards with listed fine spots that are so general, for example, Asia Minor, as to be completely unhelpful in answering the questions that I'm trying to ask, what emerges from mapping the hoard evidence is that our three cities do not seem, again, from the hoard evidence, to have attracted much electrum at all in the 5th and 4th centuries. Put another way, the hoard evidence makes it appear that the local, but not the intra- and inter-regional economies in which these cities were involved, were facilitated by the use of coin money, but their bronze, silver, or electrum. By the fourth century, virtually all of which found in the Black Sea was from Kizikis. Um, this being the case, and if we take the absence of hoard evidence for the use of electrum at face value, it becomes necessary to consider other mechanisms than coin monetary transactions. The main alternative possibility is payments in kind, although we have little idea of what Olbia and Histria or Olbians and Histria, his, Histrians may have had that Sinope, Sinopeans, or the carriers of Sinopean products would have wanted. Olbian grain is, of course, often brought up in discussions about the role of the Black Sea during the classical period, and both Olbia and Histria may have exported fish products, other raw materials, and served as conduits for products supplied by the Greek, Thracian, and Scythian populations in their hinterlands, but we lack much in the way of firm evidence here. Resolving this issue will require continuing engagement with the numismatic and archaeological evidence, as well as um, the textual record. To conclude, I want to highlight um, what I consider to be the most significant result of my research so far, namely that by integrating the numismatic with the archaeological evidence, it becomes possible to see overlapping but separate networks connecting my three communities 
in the classical and early Hellenistic Black Sea Basin, akin to those that have been identified by Michael Loy in the Archaic Aegean Basin. These networks developed at different times and at different rates, and some of them may have developed off the backs of earlier and less archaeologically visible networks, like those attested in Olbia through inscribed decrees granting special privileges rooted in guest-friend relationships. Some of them may have changed over time in terms of their shapes and directionality, as well as the communities which they included. One example of this last type of um, change that I won't be able to say much about today is the existence of a monetary network connecting Histria, Olbia, and another supposed Milesian colony, Apollonia Pontica in modern Bulgaria during the archaic period that does not seem to have lasted into the classical period. Although the eagle and dolphin coins from Sinope, Histria, and Olbia did not themselves travel through the networks connecting these and other Black Sea communities, their shared iconography nevertheless suggests the transmission of ideas, whether these ideas were seeded in Olbia, and whether there, or from there, taken up by Sinope and Histria, and whether these ideas traveled along the same or different contemporary or earlier pathways to the tiles, terracottas, and amphorae. This last note only serves to illustrate further how many questions of different kind this material raises. Now, however, I'd be happy to try to answer any questions that it may have prompted for you, um, and even more so to receive any feedback that you might have on this, as I've mentioned, still very much in progress project. But thank you very much for your attention and patience with the um, technological glitches. All right, thank you very much. Fantastic presentation and um, certainly um, as she mentioned, would be open to any questions or comments, if any of you have any. Um, one thing I, I will note is my own frustration with trying to correlate um, existing weights, uh, um, you know, various uh, balance pan weights with uh, numismatic uh, uh, standards. You, you know, can is... make it fit. You can make anything happen, is what no. I'm discovering is the problem. And no, it's exactly. Frustrating. Uh, and it, it, it's, I, I think, important to realize as well that uh, those um, balance pan weight standards are changing over time as well, too. And so, um, as numismatic standards changed, um, the weight standards for the various cities could be changing as well, too. And so, we're trying to find correlation between. Yeah, some some of these balance pan the only evidence that we have is from Athens that sort of explicitly sets it out for us. It's just a mystery if the other cities were, if it was lined up with the coin weights in the same way. And again, with these three cities, at least our weight standards are best guesses, and it's just yeah. And the the history and weight that you. Um showed the the one that weighs 472 grams that would seem to be a mina weight um but you know it's also either a little heavy or perhaps a little light depending on you know which um mina you know was was in use so it's you now again just sort of par for the course the i guess chronology of the olbian and history and weights is very sketchy um all right so. Oh, there's a question from Daniel Wolf here um, asking, is the metrology of these silver coins published based on large samples? It depends on which city and which group we really have widely variable um, quantities of coins for, for each group. Um, so the Olbian silver, just to sort of start and work backwards, um, very few, I think probably less than 50 known examples and to access all of the the examples that we do have takes a lot of digging through old Russian publications that take a long time to deal with. Um, there, the history and coins are a bit frustrating because there's so few of coins belonging to the, the early groups, which again, the chronology is just floating in air. It's based on nothing. Um, but by the time you get to the fourth fourth group, um, huge sample um, and people have broken it up in a hundred different ways so even drawing that sample together can be very frustrating as well um, and then Sinope you have sort of the most to work with although the Aramaic um, coins are a bit few and far between which is frustrating so as I talked a little bit about with you before Peter I would have loved to see if there's any fluctuation in weight by by name but 
there just aren't enough of them. Um, so I hope um, that helps. asking um, about the iconography, which is you know, oh, still yeah. a perplexing problem there. So he's, he's saying, I've seen reference to the fact that the eagle represents Zeus and the dolphin Poseidon. Any thoughts on that? And also can the iconography just be an instance of later types copying earlier types which were known to be good money in quotation marks. To start with the second part of your question, I have actually toyed around with that idea a little bit, um, especially if the problem with that notion is that it is very, it's clear that the Olbian silver was minted the latest, although, and I didn't talk about it in this presentation because it's just a whole other massive topic is the Olbian bronze, but Olbia did use the eagle and dolphin image on earlier and later bronze coins. Um, but even there, the chronology at which they began to be produced is very uncertain. Um, so it's just, I think there could be something to that, but I think that it would depend on us being able to really pin down when, um, when each city began to, to mint its coins. And then to move on to the iconography question, yes, that is an idea. Um, it's possible. Some scholars have connected um, the image of the eagle especially to the sanctuary of Zeus Orios that's at the entrance to the Black Sea. So these coins being really, really connected to the idea of um, exchange with the Black Sea into the Mediterranean, but there's not a lot of evidence for that. There's also the idea of the Apollo Delphinios connection with Miletus, which again gets us back to that problematic assumption of the foundation of these cities. Um, I think the, the association of the dolphin with Poseidon, I think is very unlikely because there's no evidence that Poseidon was recognized really at all in any of these three cities, which is interesting in and of itself because they're all sort of maritime communities and this is just not a deity that they engaged with. Um, but the iconography um, is something that I know that I need to engage with, but I have distanced myself um, from a little bit to this point. So thank you for the, the reminder to not to forget about it, which is well taken. And uh, Eric Krauss is asking on the history and white slide, linear dimensions are given. given um, in what units are they given? That's an excellent question. I think that those are, hmm. The only I way it makes sense with the weight is if they're it's meter, fractions it's, of it's a meter. Not meter. No, this is a pretty. I mean, it's lead, so it's heavy, so it's pretty small. Um, I can get back to you on that if you like. Yeah. Apologies. Thank you. And uh, Danny Wolf uh, just has a follow up saying thank you. Reference to the published metrology of the silver coins will be helpful, and I'm sure you will. Eventually present that in your I would love to be the one to do it, yes. yes. Are there any other questions or comments for Kari? All right, well, Kari, thank you again. Fantastic presentation. And um, as always, looking forward to seeing what more you will be able to do with this. And um, 